and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother into the temple. Some of you may know him as the Wanderer, others as... Mark Evergars, and some as the guy who's finally gotten Lugon off the gr off the ground and fully funded. Congratulations, by the way. Why, thank you. So, well, with that, how how are you doing today, man? <laughs> well, thank you. Like I am doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. Like I'm very happy that it's going so well. Uh, after many. Timing related issues and stuff. Uh, Lugon's finally off the ground. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I guess this so is yeah. literally third time's the charm. Yeah, although, yeah, the first time was me <laughs> still just <laughs> clicking Kickstarter, clicking <laughs> project, doing nothing with preparation and coming to the conclusion ah, uh, there's no work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the second time, though, was just bad luck. For the mm. most part. That was... Mm, still hurts. Yeah. <sighs> Don't know. Like, the like uh, last time, um, the tail end, uh, the second half of the project, coincided with the whole Wizards OGL debacle. Yeah. So, the whole thing. So, I saw... Uh, the pledges stop people just, yeah, retracting their pledges. Like, every bit of momentum we had was gone, and the project failed. Mm -hmm. So that was... <sighs> yeah, that was, that, was, that was not great, but we learned from it. Uh, so yeah. we expanded our repertoire a bit mm -hmm. and tried again. And, well, let's just say the first... 48 hours were about three times as successful uh, as the last time we did it. Mm -hmm. So it certainly helped. Which... Yeah. It's, you, this, you're asking for 1,000 euro, and it's currently at 3.7 thousand at the time we're recording this. Mm-hmm. Yup, yup. Oh. So yeah, we're almost at uh, four times our uh, our initial goal. So that is... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very nice, very successful. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, according to the calculations, we already even have some extra, like, <clears throat> space, some extra budget for artwork, uh, editing services, etc. So, it's, uh, that's going to be very good. Like, every single piece of the Kickstarter I am, <clears throat> we're raking in is going to go straight back into the project. I don't want to see a single penny. Mm -hmm. This is hobby. <laughs> yeah. So, I suppose one of the big things to bring up is the fact that with the past incarnations of Lugon, it was mm -hmm. meant it was designed to be compatible with Pathfinder First Edition and D and D Fifth Edition. Yeah. And for this one, you've expanded to both editions of Pathfinder. Uh, yes. What pro was that something that you had considered early on? In, pre in previous incarnations, or was this something you decided to tackle for this attempt at it? Uh, well, the, it was the plan also for the previous incarnation, but more as a stretch goal. Mm -hmm. Because uh, back then we didn't have... Uh, we weren't comfortable in yeah, our, our skills in Pathfinder 2E to really make it pop. Um, <clears throat> now we do. Uh, and... It also helps that, like, the previous project were three books, like the Dungeon Master Guide, the Player Manual, and the Master Manual. And mm -hmm. this time around, we're only tackling, like, the Player Codex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We did a little bit of renaming as well. So it's the classes, the species slash races, etc., that needs to be transformed. Uh, for Pathfinder 2e. That makes it also manageable. I've uh, reached out to a couple of experts, some of which I, I like, 
cannot say their name yet because it's not official, but uh, like some of them also worked on uh, stuff at Paizo, um, like the, the advanced play manual, and example, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that they are giving us a hand <coughs> and are rewriting some of the, uh, the, the races and such, helping that to uh, adapt it for Pathfinder 2E and make it nice and smooth and polished. So that's something I'm very excited about. Yeah. Now, with with that in, with that in mind, it's interesting that you mentioned um, splitting it up, splitting it off, and just doing the codex this time around because you've split it into three packs: the character yeah. pack, the classes pack, and the alchemy pack. Uh, what prompted yeah. segmenting it in that form? Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, we have like the, the whole player package. However, one of the pieces of feedback we got from last time was that um, some people wanted like separate parts of like the Lugon package. So either only the race slash species options or only the class options. They wanted smaller, cheaper packages because, you know, some people... They really like the concept. They want to splash it into their campaigns, but, you know, either don't have the funds for, like, a fully fleshed book, which I can understand, uh, or are just not interested in more classes, but are very interested in species and races. So we were like, no, you know what? We can accommodate this. It is um, fairly easy to split those three, like, instead of having, like, the entire player codex with all the player options, so all the alchemy, all the classes, and all the race of species, to make it into three separate parts. Um, the player codex does have some content within it that is only found in the player codex, though. Like, uh, content that would be too small to feature as a separate item on the Kickstarter. For example, a uh, little bit of background, uh, factions of Lugon, uh, a little bit about the nations of Lugon, etc. Mm -hmm. Because that would be too small to like feature in an entire like package of its own. Like to to give to give an example, like the race pack is about thirty to forty pages of like stats, lore, uh, plot hooks, etc. That you can like take your character on. Um, the races and nations, there are like pieces there that will allow you to tweak your character but of course like nations and factions always have like a secret of side to them they have made might have a secret agenda etc mm -hmm. so a lot of that that is also coming in the next uh, kickstarter we do which will be the dungeon master guide yeah now i may have hint i may have hinted at this beforehand but a concept i've brought up to people when they're doing their when they're doing their own setting, whether it be in their own in-house system or something else, mm. is getting a feel getting a feel for what the appendix N might be. Uh -huh. Appendix N, if you're not familiar, that was a segment in early editions of D and D that had a that had a bunch of inspirational media, whether it be books, whether it be films, whether whether it be music so on and so forth. What would be some of the things in the appendix end for Lugon? Well, first and foremost, um, let's see, Charles Darwin on the origins of species. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it is, uh, like the Lugon runs on science mixed, uh, as, as like we uh, have it now, like the, the, the scientific interpretation of ecology and evolution mixed with like the magical uh and on the magical like fantasy front um like i've got a fair amount of books that are give me a second i'm turning around for a bit see if i can i, I have still on the shelf here <laughs> mm -hmm. um <clears throat> a lot of for example fairy tales and uh, myths that are a little bit reinterpreted. Uh, I've got a, this big book that's called like a treasury of Irish fairy and folk tales mm -hmm. that I uh, 
that I've put some inspiration out of. And you know, I need to be I need to be honest. Like the uh, some of the nations and some of the quirks. Like you know, I like the classics. Mm -hmm. I I um, like race uh, race and species wise, etc. I wouldn't like lend from something like Lord of the Rings. But you know, like I've got uh, in the middle of the campaign, uh, in the middle of Lugon, I've got these magic infused woods that are rather spooky and like weird creatures stalk uh, mutated, uh, like stalk the, uh, the trees mutated by that magic. You know, I wouldn't, I, I would lie if that didn't make me think a little bit about Fangorn forests, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and, you know, uh, I've read a lot of, for example, Brandon uh, Sanderson, mm -hmm. like the, not like the magic, like the, the, the way he structures his magic systems, like that sort of like special vibe, um, like thinking outside of the box. That is something uh, we've used with the magic systems of Lugol. Like they're not based on any magic system that mm -hmm. he wrote, but like the way they have come to life, the way of thinking, we definitely took a little bit of inspiration for that as well. Yeah, the the way you the way you bring it up, it's it sounds like the thing. The thing with the thing with Sanderson's particular brand of of magic is that. The system is intricately tied to the world that it takes place in. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I'm like same here. Oh, Al, Al, that you you couldn't take Alamancy out of Mistborn without it feeling awkward. For instance, you couldn't take mm -hmm. um, Surge Binding out of Storm out of um, Rorschach without mm -hmm. it feeling um, awkward. Yeah, mm -hmm. correct. Because it's it's not just the spell or equivalent but all the, all the parts around it that in, that interacts you know since i brought up alamancy the whole ingesting and burning um metals and the effects mm -hmm. that it, that come with it yep. you know the the cycle of um high storms and stormlight in uh, well the stormlight archive mhm mm uh, and i have a f i have a feeling there is a even if you're using the the spell systems that are in uh, D and D and Pathfinder, that sort of energy is st is still maintained. Would that be the case? Um, yeah, in Lugon, mm -hmm. the magic systems we have there is like everything is built from the ground up. Like I said before, like that means that everything has been evolved, adapted from a surging situation. So, and Lugon's situation, we made it as, uh, like, magically unique as we could make it. So if you put the couple, uh, like the four magic classes, uh, take them out of Lugon and put them in another setting, uh, the, the mechanics and such, you, you can play the class just fine. That's not really the problem. Uh, the deep lore behind it, etc. Mm -hmm. That would be... You would have to tweak that quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I've, like, in the character, like, in, in the guide, like, in the player codex, etc., uh, we do provide tips and, like, okay, if you want to put this in a different setting, you might want to tweak this and this. But Lugon, uh, like, in Lugon, Magic is a substance. Mm -hmm. uh, you take it in, channel it in some kind of way through your soul, and it comes out uh, in the form you want at the other end. The thing is, is that after the so-called saturation, uh, see previous video that I did mm -hmm. with you for <laughs> the details, um, the air has been saturated so much with magic that if you do it in the normal way, like just haphazardly take in magic you'll blow yourself up due to yourself uh like you overloading your inner workings mm -hmm. so all the magic systems all four have been keyed 
to avoiding that specific problem, like four ways to tackle that problem. So in normal Pathfinder or D&D settings, you don't have that problem. So they would feel like solutions, like if you put them in as is, without like a little bit of tweaking, like lore-wise, like again, mechanic-wise, they're perfectly fine. You can just, like if you only want the mechanics, you can just put them in, no problem. But like law wise, um, it would feel like the solution for a problem that doesn't exist. Yeah, somewhat. Like like you said, similar to, uh, for example, allomancy or search binding, etc. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that in mind, you're introducing four new you're introducing four new classes. Yes. Within within it, and I. I'd like to go into those and kind of get a feel for what their play style is going to be, what sort of things they're going to be better at than other than mm-hmm. others, what the oh, design voice is, in other words. Sure. And well, first one I'd like to go into is the Golder of Frostflame. Ah, the Golder of Frostflame. Yeah, that was the first, uh, also the first class that I made uh, for this, like, right back in 2012. <laughs> Although Lugon wasn't a thing back then, but you know, <laughs> the the thing is has has been around for a while. So first of all, uh, the four classes, the four casting classes, um, they stand for certain aspects of the world. You mm-hmm. need four aspects to keep a good running world. You need creation to create matter inside the world. You need destruction to destroy what is too much and what needs to disappear. You need chaos to change what needs to be changed, and you need order to keep what is beneficial. And those are the four powers that the four casting classes are also modeled after. The Gauder of Frostflame embodies destruction. And how they do that is that they... um, Like I said, you have this very specific... Uh, problem on Lugon, so they need to uh, take care that they don't blow themselves up, which means they start slowly taking in smaller uh, amounts of energy and ramp up their spells over time. So they have a combo system. So you begin with a cantrip, and then basically they have different uh, names in the book itself, but you begin with basically your level 1, 2, 3, 4 spells in Mm -hmm. order. That's the Uh, that's the limit they have. You need to combo your spells. And those spells in the books, they do scale. So, for example, the 5e spells normally don't scale. Uh, With the Gowler, you get extra scaling on your spells also because you have to do them in order. So, otherwise, it would cause problems with, with the balance. But they ramp up their uh, magic intake, make sure their soul acclimates to the amount rushing to them uh, and through them. And at the end, takes them a while, but can fire off very, very devastating spells. Like at a high level, uh, if you let a 20th level Gowler, uh, if you give him five, six rounds, um... <clears throat> he would fire off destructive spells that are in effect he has one that is basically a power word kill on steroids mm-hmm. uh, for example or like blow uh, like blow somebody away like physically just an entire like bull rush for hundreds and hundreds of feet those those kind of things it is in this setting extremely dangerous to give the gowler time to ramp up. Mm-hmm. So yeah, think think of the gowler as a like a gatling gun. It needs to warm up, begin slow, but if it's uh, <clears throat> if it gets going, it is lethal. Mm-hmm. Oh. So that's kind of uh, and they have they they have different class abilities to give them a little bit more versatility, uh, maybe 
uh, once every once in a while, uh, skip a step. So if you really need a powerful spell out that instant, you can push yourself, uh, which is not infinite, of course. Uh, so that is a limited class resource that you can use, for example. Mm -hmm. And they've they've got all these like extra tricks and stuff. They're they're really cool. Uh, it's also one of the most popular play tested classes. Uh, it's it's been play tested from level one to about level uh, nineteen. At the moment, the only thing that needs to be tested is level twenty. Yeah. So next would be the spell guide. Yes. Spell guides embody creation. They are a support class. Through and through. They don't have... Uh, they barely have any offense on their own. Uh, what they do is they cast multiple tiny buffs... Well, tiny, small buffs on their allies. For example, uh, you have a beacon, so-called beacon. Those are those at-will buffs. If you have one beacon of a certain type, the ally gets one temporary HP at the start of that turn. Uh, these stack up to four. And uh, we are still tweaking the 5e edition a little bit, so that might be reduced or tweaked, but you have a maximum number of beacons. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like, okay, every the, if you give a spell guide enough time, they could pop a shield like on a couple of allies that gives them a couple of temporary HP at the start of their rounds, <clears throat> like maybe negating a single attack or something. And if the time is right, because those are at-will abilities, if the time is right, they can exchange all the beacons on one ally to perform a cascade. So those are their leveled spells. And basically you burn all those beacons to give one massive effect. Mm -hmm. Like that can be, uh, for example, um, we have in the Pathfinder 1e version, uh, you have a beacon at level one, gives one temporary HP, maximum four beacons, four temporary HP at the start of each round. Mm -hmm. And then they have a level one, basically level one healing spell, heals for uh, three or four times the uh, number of temporary HP the ally would have gotten. So if those temporary HPs are not lo longer enough and your ally is on like one or two health, you can pop that. They heal at level one, like 12 to 16 HP and they're back to full. Mm -hmm. However, they have lost all their beacons. But you exchange those small effects for one big effect. Those can be healing. Those can be offensive. <clears throat> giving people like more chances to crit, for example, or like make it that enemies attacking them yeah, get damaged as well, like retributive damage, those kind of things. And the higher the level of spell guide, the uh, more awesome those uh, cascades are. Like there is one highest level cascade that allows your uh, ally, though that that's level. That's very high level, like uh, I think 17 plus or something. Mm -hmm. That uh, allows your ally for a couple of rounds to become a colossal or a gargantuan. Colossal or a gargantuan? One of both. Mm -hmm. And uh, like a very large creature. So basically half a kaiju uh, to, to stomp around. So, you know, that is, sounds... It 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 sounds stronger than than it is because what we what we have noticed in playtesting is well there are not really a lot of chances to like become that big space wise in a dungeon it's barely used because you won't have space to become gargantuan but you know like those kind of effects also on smaller scale. Uh, is what the spell guy specialized at. Then they have also uh, the aid another. Uh, they have bonuses on aid and others so that they can uh, more effectively aid their allies in a non magical way. And they also have a small selection of uh, like divination spells, scouting spells that they can use to support. 
So the, the spell guide is made to make supporting as much fun as possible. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, next would be the Disciple of Anima. Ah, Disciples. So, the, the Disciples of Anima embody order. So, um, like the spell guide, he, they tackled the problems with like doing a lot of small spells and then one big one. And the uh, Gowler had that ramping up for their soul to get used to things. Uh, the disciple is like, okay, you know, <clears throat> I've uh, got this problem that my soul gets damaged. You know what? I am just strengthening the crap out of my soul, mm -hmm. uh, which works, but has a negative effect on their flexibility. Um, disciples are casters that's key of uh, both wisdom and constitution. Uh, they're like secondary class features, uh, have uh, constitution scaling, for example. But what they do is they have certain mantras. And those mantras are keyed to uh, their schools of magic. For example, you have your judgment mantra, which gives you extra uh, damage uh, equal to half your wisdom modifier on your unarmed strikes. Uh, as like just in addition to anything else you might have. Uh, however, while in the Judgment Mantra, you can only cast Judgment Spells. And in this case, the Judgment uh, judgment School is damaging spells. So you have your your, uh, yeah, your single target damage, uh, line attacks, etc. Uh, which makes it very... Uh, you, you need to be very tactical. Because switching Mantras takes a lot of time. Um, <clears throat> a full round action in Pathfinder 1e. And uh, one round action in fifth. You only like successfully switch mantras at the start of your next turn. Mm -hmm. So you lose a turn. So if you start the combat with the wrong mantra, you would you would still be able to do stuff. But you would need to get a little bit creative. For example, like okay, I need control, you know, but I'm in my judgment mantra, and I don't have time to switch. How can I use damaging spells to do control? So yeah, you maybe blast tree, for example, or like blast a chandelier down to uh, to like control the enemies. Like the the disciple is he is limited in his uh, in what he can do at a time, but you know uh, they say limitation breeds creativity. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, yeah, that is basically what 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 the disciple is like. They are a full caster. They don't need to ramp up and such, but they have the uh, their downside is choice making. You need to be very tactical. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> last of the four would be the delirianist. Uh, Delirionist, also um, known as, like, the Delirionist was the old name, like, the new name uh, is the uh, <clears throat> the Keso Monster. Uh, they embody chaos. Uh, think of the Keso Monsters as, and Delirionist as well, as the, um, like, the mad scientist kind of vibes. They're like, oh, you know, I've got this problem. I blow my soul up. Let's experiment until that doesn't happen anymore. Or, you know, let's provide small experiments. Let's do small experiments to see what sticks. Mm -hmm. So what the uh, Kaiser monsters have is they have a... <clears throat> uh, they have a flux gauge. And what this flux gauge is, is basically your spell slots for the day. Let's say... Hmm, let's say um, eight spell slots. Um, if they start casting spells, <clears throat> you'll notice that they, uh, if they are high enough level to uh, know multiple levels of Kesomancy, they <clears throat> the first fifty percent of their spell slots they cannot use for their highest level spells. So they are unable to tap into their full power at the start of a day because they need to experiment. They need to, they they cannot go full blast just yet. 
Uh, they need to experiment first. And you can do that in combat. You can do that outside of combat. Because once you go over that 50%, they can use those high level mm-hmm. spells. Uh, they also get penalties when they are like uh, when they have used one spell but are still below 50%. They get penalties and those penalties disappear when above 50%. So as a case of monster, so you have a choice. Mm-hmm. because you are very flexible in your spell slots. You don't have level 1, level 2 spell slots, etc. You just have an X amount of spell slots. You can cast, for example, level three, level 1 to 3 spell slots in them, but not your level 4s. Um, and during that time, you also have debuff. So what do you do? You have 8 spell slots. Spell slots uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, you get debuffs, and you cannot use them for your strongest spells. So what you could do is get rid of those debuffs, and use those spell slots very quickly, maybe even before combat. Mm-hmm. Which means you in combat you have three, four spell slots left. But that means that you can use your higher level magic, your highest level magic, and you lost those debuffs. So what do you do? Do you stick? Do you want to keep the spell slots and muscle through the debuffs or? Do you take less spell slots, but get rid of all the uh, limitations you have? Mm-hmm. That's kind of the choice they have. So with the case of Monster, just like the uh, <clears throat> Disciple, they're not really, uh, they are not really time-gated, but it really is about choice. So you could say the uh, destruction and creation are all about timing. And order and chaos are all about choice. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the concept of those four classes. Yeah. Now, given that path, given that Pathfinder Second Edition has its own particular take on spell lists, that mm-hmm. produces an interesting question when it comes to these four. When it comes to these four classes. Yeah. Um, we are like. Yeah, I can be very short about this. Uh, we are uh, with, like, for example, you know, the the occult spell list, arcana spell list, etc. We are still uh, experimenting a little bit with how to tackle that, um, and how to incorporate it in, like, the uh, like the bigger spell list as a whole. Um, <laughs> honestly. Uh, this still this still needs a little bit of tweaking. Mm-hmm. Um, how we have it now is that like tradition wise, like that um, all four classes are counted as their own traditions. So you have the Gaula tradition, disciple tradition, etc. Because their um, their yeah their their mechanics are very much different from like the classes in Pathfinder 2. If we find another uh, sort of spell list solution, uh, we're going to use that. But for now, they're counted as separate traditions. Mm -hmm. Now, with... Now, a specific... When I specifically refer to them, I'm talking about the big four of, like, Arcane, Occult, Primal, and Divine, which... Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, the, the four traditions, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in the ca- in the case of Pathfinder one, would they just all would they just all be in the form of the arcane spell list? Since Pathfinder only cared about arcane and div- and divine casting. Yeah, I like the um, Pathfinder one. E it wasn't that much of a problem because very little mechanics. Uh, there were some classes that dealt with like the distinction between arcane and divine, uh, but not a lot. Um, so in the Pathfinder One E version, they are counted all as arcane, but in Pathfinder Two E, it does uh, play a little bit more of a role. So we do want to have it like match elegantly on the existing system. So that's why we are still puzzling with that a little bit. Oh, yeah, I, I can certainly get that. And within D, within um, 
5e, you of course have the relationship that classes have with subclasses. So I'm curious if yeah. with these new subclasses, there's going to be some associated subclasses with them. Yep. 5e uh, like, uh, gets free subclasses. Pathfinder 1e gets free archetypes. And, well, you know, Pathfinder 2e already has basically archetypes built into them via feats and such. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're planning to, you know, we do want to keep a little bit of the distinction. So we're going to make like the overall, the overarching feat list for the classes and then um, provide uh, free example archetypes. So if you want the, the, like the archetype, this, this, and this, you can follow these paths. So like a little bit more of a, like a help because, well, Pathfinder 2e is <laughs> is exceedingly flexible on that front with its uh, with its feed system. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, they don't yeah like for example, like you have those uh, in the core rulebook. I have it uh, with me right now. You have like a sample wizard, like the illusionist, and they give an example how to build an illusionist. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how we're gonna do it as well. Yeah. So give a, give a sample. So if you want to have like a, a destruction of the material gowler, then you can uh, follow these feats and you will get a destruction based, uh, like a damage mm -hmm. uh, focus gowler. If you want to have a control focus gowler, you do this, etc. Yeah. And since you brought up on the Kickstarter about new character sheets, I'm guessing you're going to be doing some custom character sheets to reflect some of the unique mechanics within these mm -hmm. classes. Yep, uh, because simply put, the current character sheets don't really, they, they don't have, uh, like we, we've been, let me, let me put it like this. We have played this for about seven years now. My players, uh, which are, <laughs> who are many, uh, they have come with some pretty ingenious solutions to easily track each of the class mechanics. And those typically include um, elements that are not found on a normal 5e e stat sheet mm -hmm. or Pathfinder 2e, etc. For example, the beacons. Uh, you have like four beacons. Okay. So how are you going to track who has how many beacons? So there will be like a small tab on uh, the spell guy's character sheet that uh, you can fill your party in and then <clears throat> like uh, like put little, uh, we, we use little, um, how do you call it? Like those glass beads mm -hmm. to keep track of uh, the, uh, the beacons. And in our case, uh, we use different colors to indicate the type of beacon. Uh, what you also can do is use like D6s and then one is this beacon, two is this beacon, three is this beacon, etc. And you can put them on your list to see. Now, well, this one has three of beacon two. That is like the AC boost, for example. Mm -hmm. And now he has four. So those kind of elements we are we do want to integrate just to make it easier for everybody to play them. And for the disciple of anima, for example, like a uh, a spell list. Um that um, gives you a visual representation, how many spell slots you have for each of your mantras, instead of just one like full spell list num uh, with numerical, uh, <clears throat> like numerical elements, like one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. And a, a flux gauge for the Gizmo monster, of course. Yeah, I can, I can As, certainly get that. We want to make it as, as 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 easy as possible. Plus, you know, <laughs> uh, let's be honest, it's fun to make those kind of character sheets. Yeah. <laughs> so, with that in with that in mind, mm -hmm. since it since it has its own book within the within this trilogy, uh, yes. let's talk a little bit about Lugani's alchemy and how that Lugani's might differ alchemy. from normal. Well. Uh, just a clarification, it's not a separate book. It is part of the player codex. Well, let, so, yeah, let me clarify. A separate I, pack. Yeah, separate pack. So, like, 
the player codex also has Luganese alchemy, mm-hmm. like the the book, and those those free packs are just in case you want to buy something separately. Ah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Luganese alchemy. Uh, yeah. What do you want to ask? Uh, specifically, uh, how it would differ from the from the alchemy kind of item creation that would be seen in step in standard D and D or Pathfinder. Right. Um, <clears throat> in uh, the case of D&D 5e, uh, you only like roll like skill checks. You have an alchemy kit. Uh, you expend materials equal to X amount of GP. Mm-hmm. And then you have an item, which is kind of not involved. Uh, Ligonese Alchemy has like a whole item list. So you can find items in the world. Uh, you have also have feats to support it, to support uh, finding your ingredients and such. Uh, all have different names and descriptions. And you can uh, experiment with them to see uh, what comes out on the other end. Think of this a little bit as mastermind. So, okay, I take this and this and this ingredient. Okay, what's the outcome? Okay, you didn't discover a new recipe, but... Then the DM gives a hint, okay, you know, those two ingredients seem to do something together. They seem to, for example, light a flame or sparkle, something like that. And then the next time a player can uh, <clears throat> does uh, Luganese alchemy, they get a little step further, a little step further, a little step further until they discovered a new uh, recipe. And in terms of recipes, you have common, advanced, and dangerous recipes, which all have varying levels of complexity. Uh, Dangerous has the most ingredients, with common having the lowest, and common being your, you know, uh, thunderstones, weak healing potions, etc. And with dangerous being... Very strong explosives, uh, like strong permanent buffs to somebody's character that actually count as a magic item, for example. Um, Let's see what else kind of thing. Yeah, also like firearms are a thing in Lugon. So you can also make alchemical bullets. So bullets with like varying weird effects when you shoot them. Uh, Like those, those kind of things. So it's very varied. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also noticed that, uh, for example, Pathfinder 1e, its alchemy system keeps a little, stays a little bit low in power most of the time. That is just like uh, we don't want to be, we don't want it to be low in power. So we we've made a alchemy system that skills sufficiently with high level. So uh, if you keep uh, either buying or discovering new recipes, it will be very useful from 1 to 20, no Mm. matter what kind of uh, playstyle you have as well. So there are like alchemy, uh, alchemical items for casters, for like that that enhanced melee combat, like waxes. Uh, Yeah, sharpening stones and waxes that you can put on your blade, for example that uh, imbue your next five attacks, for example, and then you do like more electricity damage, fire damage, or have a little bit of a debuff attached to your attacks, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, or like basically enhance your next spell. Yeah. That kind of thing, like mm-hmm. a little bit, not like overcharge it. Uh, well, maybe in the terms of like difficult recipes, no, sorry, dangerous recipes. Dangerous recipes are meant to be like uh, very much gated uh, and difficult to obtain because you have common ingredients and you have rare ingredients and dangerous recipes require multiple rare ingredients. So it's also made to give like the game master the chance to, you know, I'm going to give them these ingredients, these items so uh, they can make an uh, experiment what they want. And also to make sure that it doesn't really go off the rails too much. Because you kind of, if the players just have 
200,000 GP and just spend it all on alchemy, then it might get a little bit ridiculous. But that's mm-hmm. that's true for a lot of things in D&D, I have to feel it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. At the at the very least, you the very least something like this might circumvent the issue of things be things being not useful enough at higher at higher levels when it comes to alchemical items, or the, mm-hmm. or um the too good to the too good to use problem that can crop up. Oh it's, yeah, like no. Everybody knows it's that always... one person who will hold on to that healing potion until the end of time and space. Yeah. Yeah, like that. That's also it's also a very good point because we also uh, we've used this alchemy system for now I think about five and a half years. Mm-hmm. Uh, this also cropped up. Like, no, but what if we don't uh, get this ingredient anymore? What do we do then? Let's hold on. Let's hold on to it. Uh, so that also has been like tweaked and taken into account, including some tips for the GM. You know, if you want to run this. You know, be don't be too stingy with uh with like certain ingredients. If they really like the bomb and they're like, okay, you know, just once in a while, just give the ingredients for the bomb so they don't feel bad throwing the bloody bomb. Come mm-hmm. on. Players love bombs. Yeah. So, you know, those those kind of things. Like we we have we have a lot of experience with this so also like tips like how to make this run fluently yeah i remember um i remember some i remember somebody wanted to wanted to do the whole alchemical bomb thing but they said what if i did what about doing that but at long range and came up with a potion loader which oh nice is is basically a gun that fu- that is doing exactly what you think it does Mm-hmm. He get he got the idea by looking at a looking at a flare gun. It was like, what if we did that, but with po- with potions, so I could fire them at short, so I could fire alchemist fire at at short range instead of throwing distance. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, that it could work. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, Path- Pathfinder had like a Pathfinder first edition had a nice like a little item for that. It was called a bomb chucker. Mm-hmm. It was specifically for bombs, and it like uh, increased the range of bombs with like twenty or forty feet or something. It's kind of handy. It was just like like uh, uh, you know those sticks that you use to throw tennis balls extra far when you're walking your dog. Mm-hmm. Those things. <laughs> it also went wrong once. Yeah, blowed well, themselves up. Of course, uh, it went wrong. Things always yeah. go wrong when the dice gods are involved because, as I've said many times over the years, the dice gods are a model of equality because no matter your background, they hate you. <laughs> oh, they hate everybody equally. <laughs> Especially DMs sometimes. Like, sometimes DMs just get, just get like, yeah, and GMs start rolling crits because screw the players. Yeah. And in some, in some cases, you've got somebody who is just cursed. And yep. no one knows why. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> apparently, apparently, dice, dice chills work. Yeah. Now, with that in with that in mind, um, because of the because of the way action economy works in Pathfinder Two E and the way it doubles down on on feats, were there were there some things that may have been may have been class features or arch, or archetypes in like D and D five E or Pathfinder one E that had to be made into feats and vice versa. Oh yes, um, especially like we we started this project from Pathfinder one E. Mm-hmm. So honestly, class feature wise, the step from Pathfinder one E to five E is relatively small. From one E to Pathfinder two E, that's a little bit more of a jump. So yes, a lot of uh, Quite a bunch of class features uh, had to be made into feats. Uh, however, 5e is also simpler, which did mean that some class features from the Pathfinder 1e version didn't quite make it into the uh, the the D&D 5e version or were simplified. <clears throat> Those class features, because Pathfinder 2e works with feats, 
they can be made into separate feeds for that system. So uh, some class features were tweaked, and indeed some were made uh, into like feeds for Pathfinder 2e. For example, to give you a quick example, let me take a look. And there we go. Uh, the Gowler has a class ability that allows them <clears throat> to extract, it's called elemental extraction, to extract a temporary elemental ally from either a source of heat or a source of cold. Uh, to have that as a full-on class feature in 5e like was a little bit too much. However, with like a feed chain in Pathfinder 2e, like you get first get smaller elementals and then like you know somewhat bigger, etc. etc. It became like this whole nice uh like optional feed tree you could spec into. So yeah that's the way that those those things have evolved. Um to be honest, in Pathfinder 2e, the only thing it resulted like it is that the Pathfinder 2e versions of the casting classes are very much um they they have yeah a lot more versatility, for example, than the Pathfinder 1e classes mm -hmm. because of those feats, which you know is understandable because like I am now looking at, for example, the Pathfinder 2e uh, uh, Alchemist. They have like a couple of um, like class features that they all have. Those are one and a half page, and then you already get to the feats. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is like it's the same with like the casting classes. They all have like their basic spell casting as a class feature, of course, and like the things that really uh, supplement their spellcasting and spellcasting styles, those are all like your classical class features. Uh, but the things that are a little bit more niche and a little bit more special have been moved to feats and in some cases have been expanded upon because they are feats and we have more space. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, with I think one of the other things that could present could present a interesting conundrum to deal with is mm -hmm. Pathfinder 1e and D D 5e have a relatively similar action economy. Not a not a one-to-one, -one, obviously. There's no swift actions in five in 5e, but it mm -hmm. is on that similar vein. Whereas 2e operates on a action point system. And mm -hmm. this is especially apparent with some of the feats and even some spells. That have yeah. differing effect depending on how many components you use, and thus how many action mm -hmm. points you use. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that was that an easy thing to work with, or did it have some obstacles with some with some features? Oh well, it's uh, <clears throat> for some classes. It's uh, for example, it provides. It, it's a bit more of a problem with the Gowler and the spell guide because, like I said, those classes are timing based. Mm -hmm. So being able to put multiple actions into your spell casting makes it that that has to be tweaked a little bit. Uh, for the Disciple and the uh, Kezo Monster, it wasn't really all that hard. To, uh, like Some of the spells actually lend themselves quite good for like having multiple effects, uh, like uh, upcasting with multiple uh, with yeah, multiple, how do you call it, actions and such. Um, however, uh, with the Gowler and the Spell Guide, we do have, <clears throat> you know, like I said before, uh, limitation breeds creativity. So we had like the the, the, the the fantasy of the Gowler, the fantasy of the Spell Guide, and then that free action system. And you know, you have free actions and the Gowler is like, is combo based. So, you know, you can, if you <clears throat> want to empower your combos and not stand still and not take any other countermeasures, I mean, that's fine. I mean, you'll get more damage. So it actually, it, 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 it would fit quite a bit. Like the, the Gowler wasn't, when we took a, a good look at it, was the problem. The Spell Guide, however, uh, if you <clears throat> have free actions and you can put free buffs out there, well, you could um, 
only do two <coughs> in the uh, in the Pathfinder one version. That may be a little bit too strong. But we're in the process of doing like little uh, play tests and tweaks at the moment to see how much it really affects it. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so you you already <laughs> somewhere I've been t- uh, been telling you already like could can guess that like the Pathfinder two E version is still very much in uh, the play testing slash uh, tweaking phase. Yeah, uh, because yeah, that does like the multiple actions. On one end, yes, they do cause a little bit of a problem. At the other side, we have a feeling that for some of the classes, it might actually fit better than 5e's or Pathfinder 1e's action economy to actually flesh out their fancy, like flesh out the thing they need to be. So, you know, good with the bad. But it takes a little bit of puzzling and testing. Yeah, that's with every game. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that in mind, since it was a recent stretch goal that was unlocked, I'd like to ask about mage guilds and where they factor into things. Mm-hmm. Right. <clears throat> okay, so the mage guilds are tied to the four classes. So you have a mage guild for the Gauss Frostflame, so destruction. You have a mage guild for the spell guides, case of monsters. Disciples of Honor. Um, well, they factor into the lore of the world quite heavily because it is already a world that like has some history behind it. There has been mage wars in the past because everybody has like if you are a practitioner of law, you know, in the early days it would maybe make sense to you know think that. The world can do without chaos. Like now, chaos can go away. So there were fights there. However, if you only have order, you have a stagnant world. Nothing can change. Yeah, sure, you can create and destroy, but you cannot tweak anything, uh, which would cause problems. Vice versa, if there is only chaos, everything will be changed. The mm-hmm. good, the bad, everything. That's also. Not really a possibility. Everything will go awry then as well. Uh, I probably don't need to tell you what the uh, what the downside is of only having destruction and no creation. Because, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything is gone. But having no destruction and only creation makes for a bloated world. So that's also a very big downside, like something you don't want to have. Uh, so too much creation is also uh, very dangerous. Um, in the past, there have been mage wars, and they have already come to this conclusion, like, okay, we need the other side. So those mage guilds kind of keep the balance. They keep people in check. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those are basically the overarching organizations that make sure everything does not go to crap again. Um, of course, like there are still people that, you know, think that type of magic is better than the others. So there are still cults. And the mage guilds are also constantly on the prowl for those rogue cults. Uh, so they have a, uh, they, they are like, they, they might not necessarily, like the main guilds might not like each other but they know that on the grand scale of things they cannot do what they need to do without the other side being present uh so yeah they also help each other a lot um so for example if uh the players can get missions and can get uh contacts out of them like plot hooks if there is something wrong with like the magical fabric of uh, of Lugon, like you know, there's a spot that is even more saturated than it needs to be, like uh, like a, a massive conglomeration of magic over there, they probably send uh, send people there, etc. Um, is there anything in particular you want to know with like their place in the in in the setting on a specific 
like area because otherwise I can talk <laughs> about this for like three hours. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it, it was more it was more about figuring out the general the general vibe with them and their place within the setting. Uh, yeah, and give. Given that, I'm curious if they ha if the mage guilds have some sort of enforcement wing. If somebody is messing messing around with the balance too much. Oh yes, uh, they definitely do. Uh, like they have their own. Well, for lack of a better term, let's call it an inquisition. Um, unexpected. Which, yeah, very unexpected. Nobody expects it. Nobody sees it coming. <laughs> uh, which takes different forms uh, in every Mage Guild. You can understand, for example, that the Mage Guild of Creation, those are all, you know, buffers, like supportive castes. Mm -hmm. uh, their type of magic makes it kind of difficult to, um, to go out on their own and uh, do stuff. Mm -hmm. So the... Uh, the Ukraine Covenant, so that's the uh, creation uh, creation guild, um, are most prone to hire like outside help, or like they have their own guards or like contingents, etc., of armed men, and they send in two of their like supportive casters to make a so-called um, what do I call it? I had a name for it. I, it was a... Let's take a look. Yeah, a unit called a petal. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're a little bit plant-based. So, yeah, might sound all sweet, but the petal is basically... Um, like, maybe, like, a frontliner, an archer, two, two, two uh, supportive casters to, uh, like, stop... The uh, the other like the the rogue caster from doing what they are doing. Um, the disciples like they can already fight pretty well. They have like improved on armed strike, so they often go out uh, in small groups on their own. And gaulers are they have this? Uh, they have a a weapon that's basically um, a double bladed scythe. Also to invoke like the image of the yin and yang a little bit, you know, that, that balance. Uh, and they're basically kind of seen as like, imagine cloaked figures, all wielding double bladed scythes, like hooded, masked, etc. Uh, being able to shoot fireballs and if they get going a little bit too much, just blow your barn away. So they are, they, they are seen a little bit like, okay. So there are problems. These are not the bad guys, but let's let's keep out of their way for the time being. Mm -hmm. They they can be very heavy handed, and yeah, the Kazo monsters, the the chaotic uh, the chaotic guys. Yeah, they they um. Let's let's say it like this. Um, you don't really know if you're on the run from them. You don't know how they're going to approach you. You don't know when. Mm -hmm. You don't know how. You don't, you, you, they're, they're probably going to be attacking you somewhere in the near future. But yeah, they're, they're like agents of chaos. They can work in groups. They can work alone. Whatever strikes their fancy. So they, they are a little bit like they are very much looser in their organization. Uh, although they tend to be like the most driven. Mm -hmm. Because also because they have a bad enough reputation as is. Because, you know, if I say a Mage Guild of Chaos, that doesn't really sound beneficial or good. Uh, so they are very, very keen to keep their reputation straight. Um, and also the chaotic uh, ways of like casting are like very, like the most volatile. So they are also the most prone to just, you know, die or get killed by a mob. Catch a bad case is, of explosions. Yup, bad, catch a bad, bad case of explosions. So the fun thing is, if you want, like, a good aligned mage guild, ironically, the best place to look is probably 
the case of monsters, the chaotic people. Mm -hmm. Because those that are still alive are probably of the chaotic good slash the happy mad scientist friend. Yeah. Uh, just a bit careful about it because everybody's looking for an ex for an excuse to deal with the to deal with them. Yeah. Like most people are very suspicious with like the case of monsters. Uh <clears throat> Well, yeah, maybe maybe not under like the magic guilds themselves. Like the, the 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 crystal order of order does work with the cabal of anarchy, like the, the the chaos the chaos people. But like outside, like for for the nobles and such, they're like, no, no, Kesemanza, go away, huh, filth, no. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those uh, the, they're walking a uh, I don't know a more dangerous path. So, with that said, what do you see the um, page count adding up to when it comes to the player codex? Woo! Um, let's say it like this. Um, the player... Um, yeah, the player races. The, uh, the, 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 race, the, the, the race and species pack will be around... 40 pages the classes including the probably about 200 250 spells will also take up like a good 80 100 something like that mm -hmm. and then all the the alchemy system and the factions and like a little bit of the background uh etc i think will make the 200 250 uh, it could even be that we're hitting the 300, depending on stretch goals reach. It's gonna be. It's not gonna be a thin little booklet. It's going to be like a genuine, nicely sized codex, mm -hmm. which is also one of the reasons why we, you know, split it a bit, because we don't want to make the book, well, too fat, too big. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. And as far as a release window, what would you be shooting for? Uh, at the moment, we uh, because we do want to test the Pathfinder 2e version uh, well, we have as a window July of 2025, so that we're giving ourselves about a year. Uh, that is, however, that that is. It, it can very well be that we can fix this in far less. Uh, this is just so we can, you know, that we have a little bit more potential time. So July next year should be easily manageable. Uh, but yeah, maybe even after, like, I knock on wood that this is not a promise. People listening, this is not a promise. <laughs> Uh, like it, it might, it might be three, four months. Could be if everything uh, goes as planned. It, it might uh, after the after the uh, Kickstarter is done, and we can get like with, uh, on with the art and the editing and such. It can be over very quickly, and yeah, there's possibility that uh, the book may land in your like in your mailbox easier than expected. Mm -hmm. Could be. No promises, but we are going. We want to. Uh, we are of the mindset that we would rather take two, three months extra and add that, like, that extra layer of polish uh, than, like, ship it in a rush that it's not a, a good uh, product that people, like, won't be proud about. Because mm -hmm. we are proud about uh like we are proud of what we made and we want other people to be as well oh, yeah. no matter their system so we want at like the 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 lore uh yeah this is a good one the lore has already been written like probably 99.5 percent i i've made my may i might need to tweak it a little bit that's where the editing comes in but it's uh the lore has been finished like the i i, I can ship a lore book right now uh it's the classes in the play uh testing that is going to take time mm -hmm. 
But with now with that said, I will certainly be looking mm -hmm. forward to seeing how it develops. But mm -hmm. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Yeah, no problem. It's a good temple. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, good thing I've got a beer. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!